Thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon for this webinar, Antenatal Corticosteroids, The Good, the Bad, and the Unknown, presented by Dr. Michael Ruma. My name is Susan Hepworth, and I will be facilitating today's webinar. Just to briefly review the agenda, I'll do just a couple of minutes of very brief um, introductions and welcomes, and then we will kick it over to Dr. Michael Ruma of Perinatal Associates of New Mexico to deliver today's presentation. His presentation will last about 40 to 45 minutes, and upon the conclusion of that, we have a lot of time at the end just for question and answer with all of those who are attending today. So we'll have about 15 minutes of question and answer, and then we will conclude. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you guys today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, antenatal corticosteroids. I greatly appreciate and honored uh, to have the chance to talk to so many of you today. Um, I will tell you first and foremost, I am a private practice maternal fetal medicine physician. I work at Perinatal Associates in New Mexico and Albuquerque, large perinatal practice. Uh, we currently have 12 offices scattered throughout the state and have a lot of fun taking care of many, many pregnant patients um, in New Mexico. Outside of work, lunch hours, after hours, weekends, and on vacations, I spend a lot of time doing a little bit of work with a variety of uh, folks in industry, uh, Hologic, Obix, and Philips Ultrasound, uh, all of which those relationships have been very fun and uh, fruitful. I uh, grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, went to Notre Dame for undergrad, did medical school and OB-GYN residency at Creighton University, was uh, fortunate to be able to do my fellowship training in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and did a master's in health policy uh, at the School of Global Public Health in um, Chapel Hill as well. I have been in New Mexico for the last 14 years in private practice. Uh, this is just one last disclosure that basically says that I am talking to you today on behalf of myself, uh, and these views do not represent my practice, uh, Presbyterian Hospital, American College of Joanne, or the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. I've done a pretty not exhaustive evaluation of the subject matter. And at the end of the day, healthcare workers uh, like yourselves, clinicians, we have to make a decision about whether we do or do not do something. And that is our decision. And so at the end of the day, I uh, am excited to talk to you about this. Uh, I don't always have the right answers, but I'll do my absolute best uh, to tell you the way we approach this. Antenatal steroids. Uh, I wanna review with you today a little bit about lung development of the fetus. I think there is a significant amount of historical contributions to this field that we need to uh, talk about as well. Uh, there's a lot of studies that demonstrate and illustrate and support what we do today and what we may not want to do. Uh, and then talk about some current societal recommendations and then bring in some controversies at the end and you know where, where we really need to take this and where we need all of you uh, to keep doing research on this field. As we know, November 17th is World Prematurity Day. We have about 4 million pregnant people in, this, in, New, in uh, the United States each year. 10% of them have preterm babies. And globally, we have that as well. Uh, about 14.9, 15 million babies are born preterm every uh, year around the world. Uh, and if you have an interest in supporting uh, efforts, dress up in some purple, uh, feel free to consider uh, you know, uh, putting something towards the March Dimes who spent a lot of time uh, bringing awareness uh, to prematurity. Let's talk about antenatal corticosteroids. You know, is it the most effective therapy in perinatal medicine? I think we probably would all agree that it is definitely assisted and helped in the um, performance in nurseries and long-term outcomes in, the, in numbers of infants. Uh, but like many things in perinatal medicine, the research, uh, its uh, substantive support uh, has been controversial, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And at the end of today, I think there is still a fair amount uh, of uncertainty about this uh, particular medication and um, where it needs to go in the future. And at the end of the day, all of us um, could help with that, with doing some research. So respiratory distress, as you know, definitely is a cause of early neonatal death. It affects about half of infants born less than 28 weeks, uh, and for sure babies that are very, very small. Uh, this typically occurs due to a lack of surfactant, poor lung development, and an immaturity of other organs. I think it's interesting to make sure that we recognize that there's five stages of lung development, embryonic, pseudoglandular, canalicular, terminal sac, and alveolar development, the last stage, which actually continues until two years of life. 
And so when we're talking about giving steroids at 24, 23, 22, maybe uh, at this juncture, this periviable juncture, we're just starting to open up that, those bronchial airways. And are we actually at the limits of the, the structure of the fetal lung? Um, you know, the lung first starts around 22 weeks as an outgrowth of the primitive foregut. It divides left and right at about a month into the pregnancy. We have airways formed at 8 to 16 weeks. It starts to canalize, as I was talking about earlier on that graph, 17 to 25 weeks. We get those ever important lamellar bodies that actually store surfactant around 22 to 24 weeks. The lungs continue to grow uh, up until term. And then really, when we talk about respiratory distress at, at term and at birth, um, you know, we have lung development ongoing really until about two years of life after birth. We know antenatal corticosteroids improve lung function by accelerating um, you know, the development of type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes, which then secrete surfactant. This helps improve lung volume and compliance, gas exchange, um, and we know that this um, effect is limited because as those steroids go away, the surfactant levels decline. Uh, type 1 pneumocytes, you know, just for your standard MCAT or board exam is responsible for gas exchange. The type, new, type 2 pneumocyte is the ever important one that actually secretes the surfactant. Um, there is a, just a marked amount of history about this, and I think it is important to go over this, and so we're going to spend a bit of historical time on a lot of different studies. But um, Graham Liggins, 1968, demonstrated this first potential benefit of this medication in sheep, um, and then was again looked at uh, by a gentleman named Delamos uh, in the early 70s. And I think that this is really fascinating because if we look at philosophers, uh, Aristotle would tell us that for the things we have to learn before we can do them, we actually learn by doing them. And so um, at the end of the day, sometimes, you know, we want a lot of research, but um, we also sometimes just have to make clinical decisions. The first controlled human trial, actually, Dr. Liggins rec recognized that there was some benefit to this medication, glucocorticoids, uh, in fetal sheep, and then rapidly within a year turned that into a human study. 282 uh, pregnant women uh, given that standard beta-methasone medication, repeated 24 hours like we still do this today, and then evaluated rates of respiratory distress syndrome, grunting, chest retraction, re retraction and then that ca characteristic radiologic you know, granular lung fields. Um, I think this is fascinating. This is the, you know, the original document. So thus the typeset looks like a typewriter because it was from 1972 and we didn't have, you know, Adobe were Adobe documents and PDF. Um, but we saw in the mothers who received betamethasone before a preterm delivery, um, they actually had a marked uh, lower uh, neonatal death rate, and that was statistically significant. Uh, we also had a lower perinatal death rate. We additionally saw in uh, Dr. Ligon's initial uh, scenario that the rate of respiratory distress was markedly lower. And you'll see over here in this area that this is where one area we're gonna have some controversy is, you know, maybe this wasn't exactly seen, but between two and under seven days from the completion of that steroid course. Um, and at the end of the day, respiratory distress in all lives bursts was statistically significant as well. Um, we also found that interestingly, this for at least ligands was of only benefit between 26 and under 32 weeks. And I think we'll go on further in the lecture talking about more historical studies that, uh, so that we're aware of how we've gotten to today. Um, we're gonna understand more about this gestational age uh, and some of the controversy around that. But at least in the 1972, we really felt 26 to 32 weeks was the time frame that this medication functioned. Uh, but when we aggregated them all together, there still was an aggregate overall benefit. And so Dr. Professor Liggins told us, you know, it appears steroids should be given to the fetus at least 24 hours before delivery if the therapy is to have any noticeable effect on lung function. And from the present results, you know, we conclude there's sufficient evidence to actually say, um, you know, that this does have a beneficial effect on lung function uh, in the absence of any adverse effects uh, to justify further trials. 
You know, people didn't really um, take that though and just run with it. Um, we interestingly, throughout um, human history after Graham Ligon's initial study in 1972, um, this exact study was replicated um, over 24 times. Uh, and so we have a massive amount of evidence that would support that the initial utilization of anti-neocorticosteroids is a benefit. But even despite that amount of information, actually human doctors, clinicians, we were very slow to actually start using it. In 1994, 22 years later, after the study of ligands, the, you know, the, the actual just amazing initial study, we surveyed, the NIH did in 1994, 500 perinatal centers, and they found that only 12 to 18% of pregnant women had actually gotten this life-saving medication. Why did we not give it? We were uncertain about the efficacy. We were concerned about complications. Uh, and then we also thought that maybe surfactant given after birth would be you know, the, the best thing since sliced bread. Um, the NIH didn't really like this because they thought there was substantive evidence about this. And so they evaluated all available data on antenatal steroids. Uh, and they really, um, in this document in 1994, told us that Antineosteroids before a preterm birth definitely improve the need for surfactant. It lowers concentrations of, of supplemental oxygen. It decreases the need for prolonged mechanical ventilation. It increase, increases and improves vascular stability in the newborn. And so they made a strong statement to all of us as clinicians that all fetuses between 24 to 34 weeks at risk of a preterm delivery should be considered candidates for steroids. It took us 22 years to get to that point um, after Graham Ligon's initial uh, landmark study. There are lots of controversies along the, the next 20 years. We're now at 2022, so we're 26 years uh, past this NIH statement. Uh, but I thought I'd talk to you about a few topics of controversy. One, um, you know, the choice of the actual med, uh, what the dosage might be, um, the efficacy at lower gestational ages, the effectiveness and safety of what repeat doses, uh, that has a lot of interesting historic study, then kind of conclude with some societal recommendations and then a little bit more controversy about timing appropriately this particularly very important medication uh, for the preterm fetus. So choices of agents, uh, you know, currently I think we're well aware that we have betamethasone and dexamethasone. Really, the, there's slightly different dosing. Two doses at 12 milligrams intramuscular Q24 hours for betamethasone. Four doses, six milligrams IM Q12 hours um, for the dex. Um, interestingly, these doses are really selected arbitrarily. They weren't like tested in great titration. They're attempting to represent the physiologic stress levels of actual cortisol in our body. And I know we're very, very familiar with dexamethasone as well because we've used it a lot during the pandemic. Um, so while maybe one or more like betamethasone we might lean on more currently, uh, definitely during COVID, I think we all got very comfortable with dexamethasone. For any of you maybe taking your ABOG boards, uh, this is kind of an interesting one why I love giving lectures. <clears throat> Hydrocortisone also, if in an absolute last resort, uh, could be given as well, four doses of 500 milligrams IBQ12 uh, if betamethasone or dexamethasone was completely unavailable in your facility or maybe due to a drug shortage. There are um, a number of studies that have compared betamethasone versus dexamethasone, but interestingly, they're mostly beta versus a control or dex versus a control, not really head to head. When we look at them non head to head just versus a control, um, this interesting study in 2004 by Job, um, just to say, you know, which might have a benefit, why would you maybe want to lean towards one or the other? Beta methasone, interestingly, um, is one that maintains a benefit of neonatal death. Uh, where interestingly, dexamethasone versus control was not statistically significant for that. They definitely both reduce RDS. They definitely both reduce IVH. They um, uh, don't seem to have a re really any cause of infection. But if, you, if we're concerned about neonatal death, maybe betamethasone uh, may be the superior med. If we look, though, um, in this study, the beta code trial, which is actually the only randomized controlled trial um, in 2007 by Elamion, um, this is also a kind of an interesting one. So we randomized women, you know, at risk of preterm birth to betamethasone versus dexamethasone. 
This one also is intriguing. There was no statistical significant difference really in anything. They all had the similar outcomes. They improved RDS similarly. They improved neonatal death similarly. But when we get to any grade of IVH, um, beta-methasone seemed to have slightly higher rates. Um, and so in this study, the author said, you know, we found that beta-methasone and DEX worked comparably but they also found that maybe DEX was slightly superior to betamethasone in reducing the rate of interventricular hemorrhage. So really just interesting, but just showing you there's, there is controversy historically about which medication we should be using. They went on to say that DEX, you know, ha, uh, maybe is a lower cost. It's also maybe more widespread available, but betamethasone is only two injections rather than four. Just one interesting study, the beta code study about which one should we choose. And if you ever had an interest in that, um, some, some evidence to those facts. What about efficacies at lower gestational ages? So we know um, in you know, 1990, when there was still lots and lots of de de debate about these, uh, this particular area, um, you know, that the, the benefit where exactly in gestational age this functions, um, there, there really was a lot of debate. Did it even work less than 28 weeks? Um, and so we know that typically when we look at steroids now today, there's a really routine examinations based on subgroups of gestational age. And so if we go to kind of the most uh, up-to-date Cochrane review on steroids, and we aggregate 24 weeks and zero days to 36 and six, um, we know from 22 trials and almost 11,000 infants that there is a profound benefit in neonatal death with using antenatal corticosteroids. We also know that it reduces perinatal death uh, by about 15%. Importantly, in respiratory distress, it lowers that by about 29%, 26 trials over 11,000 infants. It has a benefit to reducing the need for ventilation by 25%, 11 trials. It reduces IVH between 24 weeks and zero days to 36 and six by 42%. And it definitely also 50% reduction in necrotizing enterocolitis. So over the greatest gestational age where we encounter preterm uh, labor, uh, preeclampsia, fetal growth restriction, uh, oligohydramnios, uh, modi twins with selective IU or fetal growth restriction, you have problems we need to deliver, be it you know, medically indicated or spontaneous. Um, we know that these medicines between this gestational age, that this is highly functional. Um, we also know that in periviable gestational ages, 22 weeks and zero days to 24 weeks, six days, uh, if we look at an article by Deshmukh, um, in 2018, a meta-analysis was done on this topic as well. And we saw, see reductions in mortality at 24 weeks. We see it also at 23 weeks, and we see it at 22. So when we're talking about PPROM at 22 and a half weeks or preeclampsia at 23 and a half weeks, we can lean on this meta-analysis to say, yes, we can reduce the death rate of that periviable pregnancy uh, if we utilize antenatal corticosteroids. What we can't say is that when we're at 22 weeks, it is unlikely to improve outcomes in IVH or periventricular leukomalacia. However, at 23 and 24, we are seeing this. And I, this, this stuff, I've given this particular lecture, uh, 2008, 2010, uh, 2016, 2018, uh, and then now, um, these things have changed over time. And so we're continuing to learn newer information, greater numbers of infants and, and pregnant people that have been exposed to this particular medicine. And I have no doubt we're going to continue to learn more in this kind of a realm. Uh, we need to just wait for that data as it becomes more prevalent. What about uh, the effectiveness and safety of repeat doses? Um, you know, this is uh, one that has a lot of uh, information about it and we should spend a little bit of time. People tend to say, if some's good, then more must be better. And so this one, we definitely clinically in medicine became very interested in with steroids. So, we knew uh, from Dr. Liggins' uh, first study uh, that if you wait post seven days, um, you know, you come to RDS rate 
uh, there's no statistically significant difference if the baby doesn't deliver after steroids within two to seven days. And so we're stuck saying, you know, I mean, geez, should we, should we repeat the steroids? I mean, maybe we can stimulate a steroid response again. Um, and, you know, getting back to that Moore's law, I mean, more has to be better, right? It worked for the first time. So let, let's just, let's get, let's give it again. Um, so this actually was replicated uh, three different times around the world. Uh, Gwyn, Wapner, and Dr. Crowther in Australia. Uh, we all we all looked at this in 01, 06, and uh, again in 06, uh, published in JAMA, AJOG, and The Lancet. Um, if we summarize these, each of the studies included women less than 32 weeks who remained at risk for a preterm birth seven or more days after that initial course of steroids. They were randomly assigned um, to weekly injections of two doses of betamethasone until 34 weeks in Gwyn and Dr. Wapner's study. And they were uh, assigned in Dr. Crowther's study a weekly injection of a single dose, uh, not a course, uh, but a single dose until 32 weeks. And so like this is a little different than what we're doing today, because uh, I don't think many of us are doing weekly steroids. Uh, that would be not desired. Uh, but at least in the early 2000s, this was definitely under investigation. How many steroids did these patients actually get? So Gwyn, uh, you know, 35% got an additional course, uh, 22, two courses, 14, three courses. Over a fourth of the patients got four or more courses. Dr. Wapner's study, 60 plus percent of individual pregnant people got four or more additional courses. And in Crowther, similar to Gwyn. So a lot of exposure to weekly repeat steroids in these two studies. Um, some common themes that, that evolved out of each of these studies. Um, it definitely seemed to show that in infants exposed to repeat courses, they had less severe RDS, particularly at earlier gestational ages, mm -hmm. but there were no differences in chronic lung disease, uh, brain findings that IVH and PVL, a neonatal death rate, hospital stays, neck or retinopathy of prematurity. So no differences other than RDS. Um, and so we do kind of look at some of these. Here's Crowther's study. This is statistically significant uh, severe lung disease. Uh, come down here to ventilatory support with Wapner. Uh, so we, we maybe see some benefit to the respiratory outcomes. There were some pretty big um, concerns with these studies, though. And so while a great number of these patients received two, three, and four weekly courses, and then in Crowther's uh, doses, um, we saw significant decreases in birth weight and actually uh, demonstrated significant decreases in the neonate's head circumference. Um, but in Crowther's study, these didn't actually persist until um, when the baby actually was discharged. But in Gwynn and Dr. Wapner's study, we did see harm to the neonate with weekly evaluations. Uh, we did follow these children up two years later, and there was no identifiable difference in the child's physical and neurocognitive outcomes, nor any major disability in the steroid, repeat steroid, and that placebo group. So at two years, ultimately no harm, uh, but this was a profound concern uh, to uh, our societies and clinicians around the world. And so at the end of the day, uh, NIH again gave us um, help on this at, uh, in, a, in a consensus statement. And they really said that we, you know, the optimal use of steroids is to minimize exposure and maximize the number of pregnancies receiving steroids just the week prior to birth. Um, and so their takeaway is that weekly courses of antenatal corticosteroids should not be used outside of randomized controlled trials. And I think that that statement really is a pretty sufficient and persistent one uh, today. But we had to evaluate Moore's Law just one more time. You know, if some's good, then more must be better. We know like a lot, like four courses, four extra doses, uh, definitely maybe we're going to cause harm, but we are still tempted to do evaluation of something we call rescue steroids today. And this was, you know, an attractive alternative to this weekly course, because we're just going to hold off. We gave them to gave the steroids to the patient once, but then 
what if like five weeks later, then she comes back and now seems to have a very real reason for preterm birth? Maybe we could just give her uh, a course then. And we use terms like salvage and rescue and something called booster therapy. We love boosters right now, given the COVID uh, scenario. Uh, but the term that's kind of stuck uh, with this one is rescue. There's controversy even in this particular uh, realm of the steroid story uh, because Peltonini in pediatrics in 07 actually published the first randomized trial of quote salvage or rescue therapy. And interestingly in this study, they um, looked at, you know, so the woman, the woman was eligible for the trial if delivery was imminent within 48 hours. I will say that we don't always know when it is imminent. Uh, and the gestational age was less than 34 weeks. And then she had to have received her steroids at least seven days earlier. The patient, the subject was then randomly assigned to a single dose of 12 milligrams of beta methadone or placebo. And the primary outcome in this one was survival without RDS or severe IVH during that first hospitalization. So this is a controversial one because interestingly, the study did not show any significant benefit. Uh, here's our odds ratio, it crosses one. You know, we thought, okay, a dose of rescue steroids gonna be amazing, um, but interestingly, it didn't do anything for the primary outcome. Um, very interestingly, though, in this study, um, the great majority of pregnant patients actually delivered within 24 hours. And those babies definitely had higher rates of RDS and lower rates of intact survival. Uh, but the authors uh, of this study said that a single booster just before preterm birth actually may cause problems for respiratory adaptation. And therefore, these authors cautioned against uncontrolled use of repeat dose of steroids in these types of pregnancies. Um, so controversy just all along the route of this. Um, we did do in 2009, Dr. Greedy did a study, a second randomized trial of this rescue therapy. And he looked at singletons and twins less than 33 weeks. And this time, instead of a dose, he gave a course. Uh, two doses, 12 milligrams, beta methadone, 24 hours apart, or placebo. And they looked at a composite neonatal morbidity outcome under 34 weeks. Interesting. Dr. Greedy's study shows actually the opposite of what Dr. Peltonimi's study showed with a 55% reduction in composite neonatal morbidity, 55% reduction in RDS, uh, reductions in surfactant use, and um, so now this, and also uh, ventilator use. So now the story is maybe changing. Maybe it wasn't just one dose. Maybe we need to make sure we got them the 48 hours before they delivered. So the story about rescue steroids also has a bit of uh, controversy. First study showed uh, clinically difficult to predict, quote, imminent delivery, and that definitely a single rescue dose uh, tends not to be helpful. But a second study, Greedy's, showed that a single rescue course, two shots, was a benefit in 09. Let's look at the latest Cochrane uh, review on anti-neocorticosteroids. So we know from almost 6,000 infants that there is a 18% uh, reduction overall in respiratory distress rate uh, throughout time with anti-neocorticosteroids, and these are, these are the rescue ones. We also know that rescue steroids, when we repeat it as indicated, there's a reduction in severe lung disease. Uh, additional benefits from an older Cochrane review of rescue uh, coursed steroids is that there is reduction in IVH, in necrotizing enterocolitis, in systemic infection, and neonatal mortality. Uh, and so rescue steroids have definitely uh, become a mainstay recommendation. So is that, is that it? Is that the whole you know, story of steroids? So we know that we should give people an initial course of steroids if they're at imminent risk of preterm birth for whatever medical indication they may present with. We say we should not be giving them weekly repeat doses. That's definitely been proven to not be beneficial. Um, and then yes, on a rescue course of steroids. Um, and then we know 24 to 34 weeks, yes, it's a benefit for really a ton of outcomes for the neonate. And then we also know 22, 23, and 24 weeks that it improves mortality for the neonate. And we will learn more as we do this periviable scenario more often. But what about like, 
should we give it after like 34 weeks? I mean, we kind of accepted 24 to 34 weeks, 22 to, to 34 weeks, but 10 years later, Dr. Jaffe Vanderman in 2016 published a, a landmark article, uh, the ALPS trial. Um, and you know, the impetus of this really uh, emanated from Dr. Ligon's study because what you know, he was saying it maybe only works after uh, prior to 32 weeks. Uh, or maybe 34 weeks. So then what do we do with these late preterm babies? Do we just stop magically at 34 weeks? We know there's a continuum of lung development uh, in the fetus that goes until two years old. So, so maybe late preterm steroids could be useful. So Dr. Bannerman, uh, Jan Dr. Jampi Bannerman did a, a multi-center randomized trial on singletons, 34 and zero to 36 and five. Uh, she wanted them to be three centimeters or 75% of face, either one. Uh, they could have a broken bag of water, uh, or they could have a planned delivery, maybe for a previa or a creta in the late preterm period. But she was ineligible. They excluded them uh, if they had gotten anticorticosteroids before. So this is not rescue late preterm steroids. This is just late preterm steroids. And she gave them two injections of betamethasone or placebo, just like we're accustomed to. We looked again at a neonatal composite outcome, uh, and it had a lot of different things. Uh, use of CPAP, need for supplemental oxygen, need for ECMO or mechanical ventilation, or was there a stillbirth or a neonatal death within 72 hours of delivery? What did Dr. Bannerman find? So we know uh, from this landmark study that 11.6% versus 14.4% of infants in the beta versus placebo group had a reduction of the primary outcome, all of those bad things we just saw in the prior slide. And that if we give late preterm st steroids, um, we can reduce that primary outcome uh, by 20%. So pretty profound. If my uh, wife or sister is in labor at 35 weeks, um, I'm going to want her to get that late preterm steroid uh, dosing uh, of two doses so that we can actually see a benefit to uh, my neonate baby. These are the, her outcomes. We saw it in the primary outcome. We also saw secondary analysis, significant uh, benefits to severe respiratory complication, need for resuscitation, uh, and lowered the need for actual surfactant use. So Incredibly important study, late preterm steroids, the ALPS study. People were worried about infection in this group, but there was no uh, evidence of increase in chorioamnionitis or sepsis. Interestingly, in the late preterm setting, there was a higher rate of neonatal hypoglycemia in the treatment arm, uh, which is still uh, of debate today. So the consensus on this one is that administration of beta methadone to women at risk for late preterm birth delivery significantly reduces that rate of complications. Okay, so we've made it through periviable 24 to now 36 and six. I mean, should we give moms, pregnant people, um, perm steroids? Uh, this is one that's uh, interesting and I think we'll continue to have research done to it. Um, and the Aztecs trial by Stutchfield, uh, published in the British Medical Journal in 2005, is a really interesting uh, study if you want to read it. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So pregnant people that were eligible for an elective cesarean section, and I use the British spelling, um, you know, 990 people were randomized, uh, 503 pregnant people got treatment with that betamethasone. Uh, and it was two IM doses, again, of 12 milligrams of betamethasone, just like we usually do, 48 hours prior to their elective cesarean that were at least 37 and zero or beyond. The primary outcome on this one was just special care nursery admission. So what in the United States we would call NICU admission or neonatal intensive care unit admission. Um, and then secondary outcomes was actually the rate of, um, you know, the severity of RDS uh, and then the level of care needed. So realize this is not maybe what we do in the United States all the time, uh, but in uh, other places around the world, uh, we are entertaining, you know, the option of term steroids. They found um, that in the placebo group, there were markedly more babies that went to the NICU. And in the treatment group, there were less. So in the control group, they got the placebo 5% versus 2.4% in the treatment group. Relative risk 0.46 in favor of giving term pregnant women with a C-section between 37 and 38 and six steroids. 54% reduction of NICU admission. Um, so just interesting to look at. I mean, the rate of um, RDS at about 37 weeks is about 5%. 
if we give that mom steroids, we can lower that by 50% to two and a half, 2.4%. Um, this is just a graph showing, you know, what their control group looked like with the rate of admission to the neonatal intensive unit and markedly lower uh, with betamethasone administered at term before a cesarean section. So some controversy, and I, I'm just giving you this to kind of stimulate our minds and open conversation and some debate and, and with some discussion. What about our society recommendations? Uh, so we have a lot of different organizations that weigh in on steroids. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists 2017 uh, has a committee uh, statement on antenatal corticosteroid therapy for fetal maturation. We have Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine 2016, implementation of the use of antenatal steroids in the late preterm period. Uh, the Royal College, uh, you know, guiding, um, you know, folks around the world uh, actually just um, changed a statement in 2022. And I'll show you what uh, 10, 11, 12 years uh, from ARCOG, uh, how they've changed um, their outcomes. So ACOG says a single course of steroids is recommended between 24 and 0 to 33 and 6 for anyone who's at risk of preterm delivery within seven days. Whether you're PPROM, preterm labor, multiples, doesn't matter. They also say that a single course, two doses of betamethasone is recommended between 34 and 0 to 36 and 6 uh, when a, somebody's at risk of preterm birth within seven days and they have not had another course of steroids. Um, they go on to say that a single repeat rescue course of anticorticosteroids should be considered for the person uh, less than 34 weeks who's at risk of preterm delivery within seven days and whose prior course was given more than 14 days earlier. They do say though, if the clinical scenario indicates it and she got her steroid initial dose seven days prior, then that also is an acceptable time to consider rescue course steroids. Uh, just in learning over the years, when I consider something, I tend to just say we should do it. Uh, and so um, that's, if I'm considering, I tend to act on that one, uh, but this is um, ACOG telling us to consider it seven days as well. What does SMFM say about late preterm steroids? So they looked at the ALP study by Dr. Jamfi Bannerman, 34 and zero to 36 and six. If a singleton pregnancy is at high risk for preterm birth in the next seven days, uh, but before 37 and zero, they recommend a course of betamethasone. Uh, and they do say that in late preterm pregnancies receiving this, we should not delay their delivery. So severe preeclampsia at 35 and six protects pregnancy, administer steroids, and initiate the induction of labor at the time you're starting the steroid course. Don't wait to delay the patient's delivery for the 48 hours. Uh, that's an important one from SMFM. What about, um, you know, Royal College of OBGYNs? This is kind of interesting. Um, bear in mind, take a look. This is from 2010. Okay, so 12 years ago. If a patient with an elective lower segment C-section, they suggest that normally these should be performed after 39 and zero, at or after 39 and zero. And I think that we have the same approach in the United States. But they do go on to say, um, and this is why it's interesting to look at global guidelines instead of just the United States, they say that corticosteroids should be given to reduce the risk of respiratory morbidity in all babies delivered by elective C-section prior to 38 weeks and six days. Um, so this is a question I don't think is fully answered uh, around the world, uh, and it is gonna continue to evolve, and I'll end with even more controversy about this scenario, um, but just something to continue to think about, should we be giving the early term pregnancy steroids if we're anticipating that kind of delivery? They have changed this statement now, um, just uh, as of this year, uh, for women undergoing a planned C-section birth between 37 and zero and 38 and six, we should have an informed discussion with the patient about the potential risks and benefits of a course of antenatal steroids. And therefore, maybe uh, you can proceed with that. While though they go on to say, you know, we know steroids may reduce admission to the NICU. What we are uncertain about is does it actually affect RDS, TTN, uh, does it um, actually, you know, uh, help the baby's physical state? And then it does it does it potentially cause trouble like hypoglycemia or developmental delay? 
So we've covered a lot. Thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, steroids, yes, for an initial course. Do not give weekly courses. Um, and rescue course one other time in a pregnancy, yes. 24 to 34 weeks, yes. Uh, late preterm, Dr. Janfi Bannerman, yes. Greater than 70 weeks, 37 weeks, I'm gonna say maybe to be determined. Not recommended in the United States, maybe globally. Uh, and I think there will be further study on this topic as well. We've covered a lot today and I'm gonna work towards uh, getting to questions and answers. I really um, have had fun uh, talking to you guys today. The latest controversy on this is we know there's huge benefit to this medicine. It's probably the greatest um, advent of anything we do to help pregnant patients, babies in the preterm setting. But are there issues with how we time the medication? What if we actually give the course of steroids and then the patient doesn't deliver in that magical window of seven days after? which would be characteristic, characterized as inappropriate timing. But timing this thing is kind of tricky, right? I mean, it, we don't always know. I, I'm not the man upstairs. I'm not Mother Nature. I can't predict the future. I mean, ACOG says, give a single course of steroids between 24 and 34 weeks who a woman is at risk of preterm birth at within seven days. I mean, can we say that accurately? Give her the two doses and then, yep, she's going to deliver in three days. They say that a single course, a repeat steroid should be given to somebody who's gotten their steroids 14 days prior or more. And then now it has it yet another scenario where she's at risk for preterm birth. Now, now, now what do we do? Um, we know, I mean, there's profound benefit to this medicine. It reduces NICU admissions, death, RDS, systemic infections, brain bleeds, you know, brain or uh, necrotized enterocolitis, problems with the infant's gut with massive numbers uh, in Cochrane, huge amounts of information in Cochrane that support this. But, but are we, the clinicians in the United States and around the world, are we actually timing the course of steroids appropriately? This is hard to answer, and we don't have many studies on this, and I think this is an area that needs a lot more study. This is a 14-year study, 14 study by Razak Razaz in 2015 in the Green Journal. Did we get the steroids less than 24 hours or more than seven days? That's called suboptimal. Did we get it during that window that's optimal, 24, to seven, 24 hours to seven days? That's optimal. And was it actually even appropriate? Did we give them a course of steroids an initial one after 35 weeks? Um, suboptimal, optimal, questionably appropriate. Um, you know, we're looking at 34% uh, suboptimal. Um, only a fourth of our patients are getting these in a optimal scenario, timing scenario. Um, and then interestingly, over 35 weeks, um, you know, at least at this time, maybe, you know, 52% of patients, uh, maybe we're getting them, they were questioning actually the appropriate use. Um, we know if we give the steroids, she makes it for, through that first seven days and then she never delivers, every day after that inappropriately timed steroid course, there's higher RDS in the first week after and the second week after. There's higher chronic lung disease in the first and second week. There's a greater rate of innovation and there's um, worse outcomes compositively, compositively. There have been a lot of protocols to try to figure this out. And I mean, I think preeclampsia, PPROM, maybe we're a little bit better with certain medical indications. Uh, for preterm labor, we tend to be widely incorrect. Uh, there are studies that would argue that we um, you know, miss this window at least 50 plus percent of the time. Uh, there are studies that say that uh, for any patient who shows up in preterm labor, symptoms of preterm labor, that you know, there's a, a 40 plus percent of them deliver at term. So what about that? I mean, how do we more accurately identify those patients? Uh, Vincenzo Bergella, 2018, uh, SMFM preterm labor toolkit, uh, have, pre have presented, you know, we should utilize vaginal ultrasound cervical length, we should utilize biochemical tests like fetal fibronectin, uh, and use guidelines and follow standardized protocols to achieve the best outcomes. And I might ask, you know, are, I mean, are we doing this? Um, do we actually evaluate these types of patients with this stringent approach and then make a decision about do nothing 
or do something like give betamethasone. Um, Dr. Wilms, 2015, has looked at this. I mean, if we we're doing ultrasound and fetal pharmacokinetic evaluations on this type of symptomatic preterm labor patient, uh, you know, we know uh, over 30 millimeters, super low risk for preterm birth. Uh, only 1% of these women actually delivered preterm, uh, but a fourth of them got steroids. So not, not appropriate group. Uh, 10 to 30, kind of this gray zone that we talk about uh, with a negative FFN. Um, you know, this worries clinicians a lot because 65% of these women got steroids. Only 3% of them actually delivered preterm. Uh, 10 to 30 with a positive fibronectin, 18% uh, delivered preterm, 91% got steroids, and very, very short cervical length. Uh, a lot of them deliver preterm, and we, we hit this group. So maybe these are the two groups we should focus on, for sure this one. Um, we know also that you know, we can lean on things. This is another article by Dr. Gianfi Bannerman. So even in the really, really short cervical length patients, if you add that biochemical test, that fibronectin, Delivery uh, at less than seven days, uh, none of them deliver uh, in that scenario, and none of them in this study deliver within 14 days. So maybe we should focus on uh, NPV of lab tests, uh, along with our cervical ultrasound. Um, we know um, that we want to make sure that we're doing an appropriate job with timing this. If we don't do it, we're going to have higher rates of NICU admissions and, and trouble. But we also know from some very recent articles out of Indiana, uh, Alexandra McKenzie, Dr. Haas, um, that if we don't appropriately time steroid administration and the pregnancy goes on to deliver it term, interestingly, maybe we're causing harm because there seems to be a greater rate of NICU admission and a greater rate for small for gestational age babies. So patient shows up, for whatever reason, maybe a workup for P-PROM or preeclampsia or some issue, uh, or preterm labor might be the most common one. And we say, oh, let's just give her steroids. And interestingly, um, the issue is, is the beta-methasone exposed group, 12% got admitted to the NICU when they delivered at term versus 6% if we did not give steroids. So what these authors are suggesting, uh, this is a follow-up uh, study, uh, uh, well, um, you know, NICU admission 1.5 times higher if they got steroids, SGA, 78% uh, higher rate of SGA for, with this paper from Alexandra McKinsey. Her colleague Queen also looked at this and, and basically is showing that term newborns whose mothers were given steroids for threatened preterm labor had higher rates of lower growth percentiles under the 10th percentile, that this actually persists at age five. So I'm showing you this just as new, the, really the latest controversy on antenatal corticosteroids. Uh, mothers exposed to betamethasone, 13% of their babies at age five had a lower growth percentile versus unexposed 7%, uh, you know, an odds ratio of maybe two times higher. So are we causing potential harm? And these authors are asking us, you know, maybe there is a need for more judicious use of antenatal corticosteroids in women who may not be likely to deliver until term. This is going to be our latest controversy. And so SMFM has recognized this, our uh, colleagues, Dr. Feldman, Dr. Combs, I mean, they're wanting us to look at new quality metrics. Are we optimally timing antenatal corticosteroids? We were incentivized by the Joint Commission before 2020 that with this little metric, perinatal core measure 03, did we give a hospital organization, a clinician, did we give steroids any time before the patient delivered preterm? And we actually were really good. We gave a lot of steroids around the United States. 97% of hospitals in the country adhered to this. The problem with perinatal core measure three is it does not and did not evaluate the accurate, appropriate timing of steroids within seven days of birth. Dr. Feldman and Dr. Combs and the SMFM group that put this paper together says we need better prediction tools uh, and a lot of research needs to, be do, to, needs to be done on this area. We need to encourage clinicians to thoughtfully evaluate the actual risk of birth within seven days before giving steroids. They want to avoid administration of anticorticosteroids to patients who are at risk of preterm birth is actually low, one of which they suggest, someone who presents with uterine contractions but has a negative fibronectin evaluation. Uh, think before just giving the antenatal corticosteroids.
We also need to do better in this, not just with the timing, but just with our equitable evaluations and administration of medications. And I think we're recognizing this more and more in our field. Uh, a recent study uh, by Undusco in 2020, for, for women of color at risk of preterm labor, they were 38% less likely to receive steroids. Why is that? We don't understand this evidence of a significant disparity. We also know that the actual lab testing to predict preterm, preterm birth is significantly different between different ethnic groups. 20% Caucasian, 17% Black, 11% Hispanic. Why do we see these ethnic differences in the evaluation of these scenarios and in actually administration of this critically important medication? I'm gonna conclude uh, with that and say, anonymous corticosteroids is definitely uh, and I think we would agree, one of the most important therapeutics that we have uh, in our armamentarium today in perinatal care. We have learned historically since 1972 and a lot of different studies, which I've shared with you today, the specific indications for why, how, and when we should be administering antenatal corticosteroids. For certain, this is going to be continued to be refined and a lot of effort uh, is going to be required uh, to achieve these greatest results. The most recent articles by Dr. McKinsey, Dr. Haas's group, uh, definitely talk to us about there is still concern about this specific subset of medication. We may actually, if we randomly and non-judiciously give steroids, we may actually be leading to term NICU admissions. We may lead to uh, lower birth percentiles, uh, birth weight percentiles for babies and at age five of life. Um, so as the group from SMFM is asking us today, all of us listening today, we really need to achieve greater research and quality improvement efforts in order to improve the appropriate timing of antenatal corticosteroids for patients who will truly deliver preterm. And we need to minimize our exposures for those patients who ultimately will give birth at term. I really greatly appreciate your attention today. One of my favorite authors is Atul Gawande. We're obsessed in medicine with having the great components, the best drugs, the best devices, the best specialists, but we often pay little attention about how to make them fit together well. This is very much an area with antenatal corticosteroids where we need to spend more time uh, and do more research on the field. And I have faith that we're gonna, we will do better uh, in the future. I'll ask you one quick question, and I know I can't get any answers verbally, but I'll ask you who this gentleman is, this famous researcher, author, and pioneer in fetal neonatal medicine. And just so you can put a face with a very famous name, this is Professor Sir Graham Liggins uh, of the Liggins Institute who lived from 1926 to 2010. Uh, thank you very much for uh, taking time to listen to me, uh, throw up my uh, business email, a personal email, a cell phone number, office number. If you have a chance, you wanna reach out, I'm definitely happen, happy to take any um, calls, questions, emails, et cetera. If you wanna make a visit out to New Mexico, love to have you. Thank you so much for uh, listening to me and I will stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruma, for joining us today. And we hope everybody has a great rest of their afternoon. Thank you so much.